I think that we're seeing for, for the first time, um, really, uh, cybersecurity became, becoming something that the public are aware of on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which I think is a really positive development. Uh, the constituency I represent is around two-thirds rural and about a third in um, quite industrial towns. The bulk of the population, as you might imagine, is in those towns. But in the rural villages, the real concerns, you know, I'm on a surgery tour at the moment during summer recess, um, and the real concerns over access to broadband, mobile broadband, we hear it again and again and again. Um, the government, which I'm a member of, um, was elected on the pledge of levelling up so communities like mine that feel like they've been left behind by successive governments. You know, one of those key pledges was extending broadband coverage, bringing, bringing some of the technologies that we see in towns and cities into these, these more rural um, and northern left behind communities, you know, ending not spots. Um, and COVID has thrown a harsh light onto those ideas. You know, we're all working from home, we're zooming into meetings like this, more often than not consuming our news and media um, online. So for those without reliable, fast, uncapped internet, you know, the pandemic has created quite a stark divide. Um, so for areas like 5G and the rollout of that, you know, we are seeing these pledges from government and political parties rubbing up against those cyber security concerns. And you know, we have to ask our que uh, question as parliamentarians, you know, are our actions in protecting the UK's critical national infrastructure holding back communities like the one I represent. And that's it's quite a difficult tension. I suspect the answer is probably more yes than no. Um, but, you know, we have to balance these concerns. And, and I think the public debate is a healthy one um, at the moment. Recently, we have actually, yes, introduced an online safety bill. But uh, before this, what we have actually done uh, in terms of the parliament and how we can actually combat uh, cybercrime was, uh, for past couple of decades, we had a Fiji police force, which was basically dedicated for cybercrime investigations. So they had a unit with the Fiji police force, uh, whereby all the investigation used to go to them and they used to uh, investigate. But the problem was we didn't have a particular act, especially on the cybercrime in order to ensure that we can actually prosecute people within Fiji and outside our jurisdiction. Because most of these crimes that are actually occurring in Fiji with regards to cyber crime don't actually happen in Fiji. People are sitting in other countries and trying to actually do this crime in Fiji. So first thing we actually came up was a financial intelligence unit known as FIU which was basically designed as an agency to look after and collect data, analyze and disclose financial information and intelligence and is the leading agency in Fiji. Primarily trying to focus that the money that is going outside of Fiji is not used uh, for the purpose it's intended to and mostly in terrorist world. The other thing we actually came up with after that was online safety commission. Uh, this was basically to do with the, all this social media and everything whereby people were posting everything left, right, center, and there wasn't any law to actually say that what is ethical and what is not ethical, what should be going on and what should not be going on. So in back in 2016, I believe we came up with this particular act, uh, online safety commission act. And now, um, what we have done is just in our last sitting, we have come up with the cybercrime investigation bill itself. So it is before our committee. Uh, we have started our work uh, with regards to scrutinizing of this particular bill. And uh, we are at this point in time, we are collecting submission from general public in order to get their views. We had some uh, submissions that were given from overseas as well. Uh, trying to actually help us out. Uh, but as I said, that uh, one of the major factors is that these cyber crimes are not committed in Fiji. In terms of the oversight, uh, we, because we have a number of departments involved in this, there are a number of committees who do the work. Uh, probably one which has a high profile here is the uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. 
And so some of those bills that I've mentioned, like critical infrastructure and the espionage and foreign interference, uh, has oversight from that committee from two respects. One, the actual legislation that is passed uh, to make sure that we give the agencies the tools they need to enact the cyber protection, uh, but also to balance it with the privacy uh, requirements and the, the protection of Australia as, a, as an open and plural liberal uh, democracy. Uh, so there's a, a balance that we're constantly working through uh, those issues to try and strike that right balance. Um, and things like the Critical Infrastructure Bill also went through that uh, committee, uh, briefs from agencies over issues such as Huawei that Simon talked about uh, before. There's also, uh, for example, the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee that I chair, uh, which looks at some of the defence applications in the cyberspace. Uh, many of our international engagements are overseen by um, foreign affairs and trade. Uh, and so there's an oversight or audit function um, by the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee. And there are some elements uh, from the Environment and Communications Committee perspective, uh, but the real uh, scrutiny from the Senate committees, partly it's on legislation, but we have a process called estimates, where uh, the government has a policy, uh, there's an appropriation of finance, for the implementation of those policies and the estimates process, which occurs several times a year, uh, is an opportunity for senators from not only the government parties, but particularly the opposition and crossbench to call in the agencies or the departments uh, and the minister or the minister's representative to ask about how the policy has been implemented, how the money's been spent, are we achieving the objectives? Uh, and so there is uh, an accountability and oversight function there. The last area I would refer to in terms of the committees is that most of the Senate committees have a, a reference function where if there's an issue or a concern uh, held by the community that's reflected back through either House of the Parliament or perhaps directly from the Minister, they can give a reference to a committee and that can be one of the joint committees or a Senate committee to actually develop a report that may recommend to government a particular course of action that they should take uh, in some of these areas. Generally speaking, uh, in terms of technical areas such as cyber, uh, you tend to find that the committees are more responsive and acting in an oversight role rather than initiating the, the detail of any proposal. Uh, but the committees do have a, a role uh, in some areas of policy in terms of bringing forward recommendations for government. Um, the, the question which, which you asked me when, when you invited me to do this, which is how parliamentarians can best engage um, with the executive on this. And, and my experience as a, as a relatively new parliamentarian is that actually the executive is paying very close attention to this. You know, because, um, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, you know, we are seeing cyber security running through um, pretty much all of the issues which, um, as a government in the UK, you know, we are trying to bring forward, whether that is extending access to broadband, whether that is the challenges that have come out because of COVID facing the NHS, um, you know, cyber security runs alongside all of those. So, so ministers are alive to the subject. Um, you know, again, it is keeping pressure on them to make sure that um, you know, what we are feeling and what our constituents are feeling are are listened to um, because they, you know, the answers to these questions are increasingly um, complex. In, in that case, I believe there needs to be a more collaboration between such agencies in countries. Like, for example, I would say in South Pacific, like between Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, Australia, New Zealand, we have that. But when it comes to other continents in the globe, we don't. So there's a misconnection in that. The other thing would be like, for example, if parliamentarians and the executive arm, they can actually come up with uh, regards to the Ministry of Trade and Commerce. For example, if the trade is going to be happening in between two countries and two companies, they can actually communicate to say whether that particular company is legitimate or not. And the third one would be the corporations between the banks. Uh, one thing that we have actually seen in Fiji now, like for example, before all the transaction used to be done manually. Now we are actually doing internet 
transfers. But before you can actually transfer, you need to actually send in all the records to the bank. I'm not really sure how the banks that do it, but they do go and check the backgrounds. And if they find that particular company is legitimate, that bank is legitimate, then only they will actually come back and put them on their internet banking. Otherwise, you won't be able to actually send the money through internet banking of that particular bank, whichever one you are using. So these are some of the things that we are actually doing in Fiji to actually ensure that our private sector uh, employers and uh, companies, they are not affected by such crimes.